Okay, one thing that we try to do at Azim Premji University is to start things on time. It's it's ten o'clock on my clock and hopefully your clock too. Uh, good morning, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this online summer workshop uh, on behalf of my colleagues at the Bhopal campus of Azim Premji University. So I'm sorry if there's a background noise. Uh, so just to introduce myself, I'm Raj Gopal. I coordinate outreach for the university. And it's it's uh, it's so heartening to see, huh? to see a wonderful turnout for this interaction. So why are we doing this? Why are we doing this, this session? If I have to, if I can quickly summarize while we're waiting for others to join and I hand over to my colleagues to take over the session. Uh, broadly, broadly three reasons. One is we want you to have a better relationship with your school subjects. Right? I'm not saying that you don't have, but but probably after this session, you know, you will have a, a much more friendlier relationship with what you're learning at school. You know, let it be languages, let it be sciences, civics, or economics. Right. So that's number one. Uh, I mean, if you ask someone, why do you learn a language? I think the classic answer that we get is learn language to communicate. But to communicate what? How to communicate, right? Or there are various other facets to the language learning. That's part A. Second is, this is an opportunity for you to interact with university university professors. Right? So I, I'll request people to be on mute, please. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be extremely difficult. You don't have to unmute yourself unless you have to speak. So, so the second part is an opportunity for you to interact with the university professors. You get an idea of how a university faculty or professor would look at a school subject, what they call a discipline, right? Through themes such as comics or guzzles or aliens or environment or say a union budget, right? So that's the second part of why we're doing the session. Second, we did this workshop. Finally, we did this workshop at Bhopal, the campus at the Bhopal. And based on the feedback, I would say positive feedback that we received, we thought we must take this to more students across the country, right? So, so that's the quick summary why we are doing this session. One is you, we want to have a much more better relationship with your school subject, a renewed relationship with your school subjects, what you learn. Number one, second, opportunity to interact with the university professors of Azim PMG University. Third is uh, the workshops that we did at the campus at Bhopal. We want to take it pan India, right? So the four days, the upcoming days are dedicated uh, for language, English language specifically, sciences, that is biology the, uh, tomorrow, then history, and then the final day we close with uh, economics and social science. Right? So on that note, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to welcome my colleague uh, Debelona to take stage and then uh, take it from here. I'm not taking the time to introduce her, herself and her their work they've done, they've done. You should look at their profile pages. Uh, or the villain, you could introduce yourself uh, when you come on stage. And uh, I'm slightly old fashioned. I would recommend that you should have a small notebook and a pen and a paper, whatever, to make notes of what we are saying, going to say here. I have my note and pen ready. So, on that short introduction, uh, over to you, Devlin. Thank you, Raju Gupal. Um, well, I, um, I teach here at Bhopal at the English campus. Uh, my PhD is on the health humanities, but I came into literature because I love to read poetry. I, I write poetry. And uh, the guzzle especially is um, a favorite form of mine. If, if you're in India and you uh, listen to Hindi film music, uh, there's no way that um, you can escape the guzzle. And you, you must be familiar with the guzzle without really knowing that it is the guzzle or what the guzzle does. Uh, or even the fact that the ghazal has been written in English. Uh, so today we are going to um, have a fun session really because literature classes are also about having fun. And um, we are going to start with a Hindi film song that most of you know, um, which is also a ghazal. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, sure. So. We are going to start with, sorry. Yeah, with this song that most of you know, we are going to listen to it first and then launch into the session. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
Okay, so the reason that I wanted to begin this session um, with a song is because we often think that literature is, sorry, I just need to. Uh, I need to go to the next tab. Uh, can you help me, Sadaf, here? Yeah. Need to go to the next tab. 
how do I do it? Okay. In, in the browser. But that's what I'm trying to do, but. Is it stop sharing and start sharing again? No, that, that's fine. That's fine. We got it. So the reason I began with this song was because most of us think that literature is about the printed word on the page. Um, but if you look at the ghazal, uh, when you hear it being sung and hear it being sung in probably a song that many of us have heard, if not all of us, um, we look at literature's uh, affinity with other forms like music, right? We often think um, that poetry, most of us, the way that we read it uh, is only meant to be read, but that's not true of the ghazal. Now, if you never heard this ghazal being sung um, and if you were just reading it, yeah. it would look like this um, on the printed page without the music, without the hoo-hoo and the mama, you know, it would look like this without the music. And um, which is to say that where did the ghazal originate then? Because um, our introduction to the ghazal was it being sung, it being sung and it being sung in a way where melody is very important part of it. If you look at, um, let's say um where else would you have seen the ghazal you would have seen the ghazal uh in a film like umrao jan 19th century when we think of the ghazal when we think of its history uh we think of the mushaira um what is a mushaira a mushaira is a gathering of poets just like i think we have spoken word poetry we have poetry gatherings where we all sit and recite poetry now that's not just true of people uh, of you and me of our age this has always been true uh, literature has been performed and it is usually uh, spoken in a gathering of people people who get together to listen to a story or listen to each other's poetry now such a gathering was um, called a mushaira and usually the way uh, to read a ghazal there was a particular performative way in which a ghazal um, was recited or sung or told. Um, usually uh, people sat together and um, uh, they, the convention is to ask for permission, uh, is to say ars for maye. And uh, when you are, or ars kia hai, right? I would ask for your consent and say ars kia hai to a group of people um, around me, friends, fellow poets, and um, this gathering would respond back and give consent and say, Ishad, right? And this is how usually uh, a ghazal begins. But if you look at the ghazal, it's um, not just 100 years old. In fact, uh, the ghazal is uh, one of the oldest poetic forms uh, that is still being practiced. Now, before we go into uh, the ghazal, um, as we will read in English, um, what is uh, the history of the form? Um, if you look at the ghazal, it has it actually has roots in Urdu, in Hindi, uh, and in Arabic. Um, and um, what's interesting about the ghazal is uh, that in most parts it was sung. Um, it was not necessarily spoken, and which is why we began with the song. Um, and usually the way it is sung is that the first line is, is recited. And um, so, Hoshwa loko khabar kya bekhudi kya cheez hai. So when I say this first line, it's like an introduction. It's like I'm introducing, I'm, I'm introducing a thought and you guys are all sitting, instead of being online, you're sitting around with me in a room. I introduce this line and you repeat it. Uh, and you repeat it and then I say, right? So there is a certain performativity. The poet recites the first line of the couplet and the audience recites back to him. 
And so there is a certain um, intimacy between the poet and the audience. Uh, there is a certain playfulness. There is a certain anticipation that happens when you see, when you introduce the first line and the second line happens. So um, in talking about the history of the ghazal, Ahmed Ali, uh, in a in a, a book called The Golden Tradition, an anthology of Urdu poetry, 1973, has very has uh, uh, established very interesting connections. Uh, with another very similar word that is also Arabic, uh, the ghazal. Please, uh, anybody who speaks Urdu or Arabic here, I'm not a native Arabic speaker, so please forgive my pronunciation. <laughs> In our offline um, um, sort of session workshop here at Bhopal, we had an Urdu teacher who, who corrected my pronunciation, so I'm very happy to be corrected. So um, in this um, anthology called The Golden Tradition, Ahmed Ali actually um, creates a connection between the ghazal and the ghazal, um, in which in the English is also called the gazelle. Um, uh, no, I don't want to stop, stop sharing. Okay. okay. Um, so the similarity between the word ghazal and the word ghazal, which is uh, Arabic for a deer, the word gazelle, uh, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E -L -L -E in English. Um, so Ahmed Ali actually creates, uh, looks at the relationship between the word ghazal and the word ghazal or the gazelle in English. And it's a very interesting connection because um, uh, often in, uh, if you look at the origins of the ghazal as a form, uh, especially in, in the poetry of Hafiz in 14th century, um, the word ghazal actually meant uh, the agonized cry of the gazelle or the deer or the doe um, when it is cornered or mortally wounded. I thought that was a very interesting connection for um, a poetry um, form to have, a poetry form like the ghazal to have. I mean, 500, 600 years later, when we um, are reading the ghazal, we don't think of such a connection uh, with, especially with the figure of the deer. Um, now, uh, the figure of the deer is, is important because uh, it is not just a metaphor for the beloved or the beloved's beauty, eyes like the doe or things like that. It is also a metaphor for the mystical quest. Now, if you ever study literature and different literary forms, uh, you'll see that the 14th century poet uh, Petrarch and then the 16th century poet Thomas Wyatt actually talk of the figure of the gazelle or the doe. And in um, romantic um, poetic traditions like courtly love poetry or even the ghazal, uh, the figure of the gazelle, uh, or like Ahmed Ali saying, the ghazal, uh, the deer, has uh, interesting connotations. Uh, and, and like I said, not only as a metaphor for a mystical quest, but also for um, the metaphor of the chase. Um, because a lot of the ghazal uh, is about the female lover. It's about longing. It's about um, the theme of love. And um, it also, the ghazal as a genre, is um, derives from um, the Arabic um, ode, Qasida. Okay, so uh, mostly ghazals, uh, where, how they originate, um, are about ideas and ideals of love and beauty, um, beauty of the soul and beauty of the body. And uh, most often traditional metaphors or traditional um, analogies include um, images of rose, um, uh, cypress, dove, bulbul. Um, now, that is, of course, uh, to tell you about the tradition of the ghazal. Now, what happens? How does the tra ghazal travel? How does it 
how is it written in english how does it travel to um the roman script because if you notice um that especially when we when we read literature and when we think of literature we think of literature as unidimensional when we especially when we think of literature in english um we are especially aware in the classroom that um it is translated in english but if you read the ghazal here in the rekta um website it is in the roman script um whereas uh the language is a mix of hindi and urdu right so here uh, we are keeping the roman script um on one hand uh, which we think of is as english but we are also talking of the language english so how does the ghazal as a form uh travel uh, to be being written in the english language not just in the roman script right um and this happens in part because of the poet aga shahid ali um he's a kashmiri poet and um like how literature travels you know poets travel poets go to other countries they carry their ideas with them they carry um you know their their metaphors and aga shahid ali actually um introduces this form in um especially the us uh to poets like adrian rich um to poets like marilyn hacker who actually start writing the ghazal in english and now and this is the interesting part and this is where we will read um the ghazal in english and look at what we will call the anatomy of a ghazal but we will come to this later we will read um two ghazals um two two kinds of ghazals actually two subjects of the ghazal two on english a uh, two on light and two on darkness now um this is um a ghazal called off light by aga shahid ali um the poet who travels to the us and introduces it to um english poets poets who write in english um and this is how the ghazal goes we are just going to read it um at dawn you leave the river wears its skin of light now if you were sitting in a mushaira you would probably the poet would introduce the first line repeat it create a sense of anticipation and once you've recited the first line you would repeat the second line at dawn you leave the river wears its skin of light and i trace love's loss to the origin of light i swallow down the goodbyes i don't get to use at grief speech she waves from a palanquin of light my book's been burned send me the ashes so i can say i've been sent the phoenix in a coffin of light from history's tears learn a slanted understanding of the human face torn by blood's bulletin of light it was a temporal thought well it has vanished will prometheus commit the mortal sin of light she said my name is icicles coming down from it did i leave it somewhere in a margin of light well when i go off alone as if listening for god there's absolutely nothing i can win of light now everything's left to the imagination a jinn has deprived even aladdin of light we'll see manhattan a, a bride in diamonds one day a bash to remind her sweet man brooklyn of light a cheekbone a curved piece of bro a pale eyelid and the dark eye i make out with all within of light stranger when the river leans towards the emptiness abandon for my darkness the thick and thin of light now we are not going to analyze the poem we just um getting ourselves familiarized with the form okay now this was aga shahid ali probably writing in the 80s 90s uh he dies i think by 2001 and um, the second poem uh, we have is called a light ghazal again uh, this is to and this is by uh, an american palestinian poet called um hala alian 
um, Halalian teachers in New York University, if I'm not mistaken. Now, why I picked up this guzzle is to show you the continuity between poets, the continuity of ideas between um, literatures of, of poets between different countries, okay? Uh, which is not to say that um, a guzzle begins here and it, it only belongs here, but how it continues. Um, usually originated um, um, in Arabic, um, continues the metaphors, the, the, the images continue in courtly love poet. You have Fafiz in the 19th century, you have Ghalib, then you have Aga Shahid Ali writing in the 90s, and then you have um, through this kind of continuity of, of metaphor, of theme, um, a guzzle on the theme of light called Light Guzzle by Hala Alien, completely different, but still a guzzle and still with themes of light. I'm terrible at parties, secrets, and money. I want my stars sexy, fast light that's prophetic, no nonsense about physics, refraction, past light. Even in Barcelona, I can't turn a bike. I let you change my mind, free will and wet hair. One night, I let you pour white wine. I drink, it's a gas light. Happy now? We're both like this, full of risk and nowhere to put it. We sidle up to strangers with dry cigarettes and ask, light? I want small churches and noisy continents. I want you, I want you better. I want you moved by what moves me. God, glass, light. You like the line about men bored with beautiful women, as though boredom's the price, as though those peonies weren't a gaslight. It's okay, I play dumb. I count codes under my breath. I circle you like a dove, devoted planet. I see the whiskey bottle, I forecast light. I'm a better gambler than wife. The house fills with music and your singing. Dear enabler, dear truce, I know you see the moon's steadfast light. I know you remember Madrid, Istanbul, pine cones that trip to Iceland. How every midnight had a sun, how we clung to its last light. Now, I, don't, I know we don't have time. We probably don't have time to go into the other part of the guzzle, but I just want to take five minutes um, to familiarize you with the anatomy of a guzzle. Now, think from where we began with a song in, in Bollywood, which is a guzzle, which is sung, uh, which you listen to, you don't read. From this last poem by Hala Alian, which is also a guzzle, right? But it reads and it sounds very differently because you read it on a page. You're no longer in the three-dimensional um, uh, surrounding of, of, of image and, and sound, but only of print. It's, it's two-dimensional on a page. It reads differently because here the line breaks are different. It's called an enjambment where, um, because a sentence in a poem is not a line. A sentence is something that ends with a full stop. But in a poem, a line is visual. It's where um, visually something stops. And when it continues into the second line, into the next line, it's called an enjambment, okay? So you read it like fast light, that's prophetic. You don't stop at fast light. So when you read the guzzle in English, it's very, very different. And yet it is, the form is the same. Now, uh, if you look at the parts of a guzzle or the anatomy of a guzzle, it's more or less the same. Because uh, for it to be called a guzzle, no matter whether you it's sung or whether it has the imagery of a, of a, of a deer or, or the metaphor of the quest or whether it's romantic or not, it is a form. And by form, I mean that um, it has certain rules of being written. And um, so the first line of the guzzle is... Um, called the Misrai Ula, okay? It's what you recite in the ghazal, the first line, like in a mushaira, when a poet goes and says, Ars kia hai, and your friends say, Ishad, you, you, you read out the first line of the ghazal. So, Khoshwa lo ko khabar kya, bekhudi kya cheez hai. 
and you recite it and it creates that anticipation. What is it? What is going to come after it? What is the poet going to do? So a ghazal is in many ways about the surprise of rhyme. The reason uh, that most poetry, when we think of poetry, we think of rhyme is because um, the older forms of poetry were usually sung or recited. And that's why rhyme is a big part of, of forms of poetry um, that was sung. So the first line of the ghazal, the Misrai Ula, that is introduced and creates a sense of anticipation, follows by the second line of any shade. The shade is the couplet, okay? And it's it can stand independently. When you, uh, you may not actually recite the whole ghazal, but only, uh, you know, recite only two lines uh, from a ghazal, and that's called a shade, okay? The matla is called the, the first two couplets of a ghazal is called the matla. So matlai ula and mas, um, sorry, misrai ula and misrai sani. Um, so hosh walo ko khabar kya be khudi kya cheez hai, ish ki je fir samajye be khudi kya cheez hai. So the, it's a share in it in itself. Now we come um, to the rhyme of the ghazal. Now, if you if you uh, look at the ghazal, you'll see that um, here, if you look at the ghazal, you'll see um, the first ghazal. So for example, the origin of light, palanquin of light, coffin of light. So if you notice, off light is uh, repeated. This is what we call, uh, sorry, I'm going to, um, yeah, this is what we call um, a refrain or what we call a radif, okay? This is the refrain or the radif that is repeated. And the kafia is um, actually um, the word that rhymes with it. So origin of light, palanquin of light, coffin of light, bulletin of life. And the sound, the ner sound, win, in, quin, Coffin, bulletin, margin, win, Aladdin, Brooklyn. This sound is what we call harf a ravi, the sound of it. Okay, so um, two or three things to remember. Um, uh, the couplet is called a shair. Okay, uh, the matla is the first shair of a ghazal. Um, the radif is the repetitive word um, and uh, the kafia is the word, the rhyming word and harf a ravi is the sound that is being made. So just to give you a quick um, example of um, another ghazal about the dark times. Now, Marilyn Hacker is an American poet um, and she writes the ghazal. And um, this is not a part of the ghazal, okay? This part in dark times. But uh, usually in English, when you hear the word dark times, it actually refers um, to Brecht's uh, very famous um, uh, saying that uh, in the dark times, will there be singing? Yes, there will also be singing about the dark time. So here where uh, Marilyn Hacker begins, a ghazal on the dark time. It already has a continuity with another uh, saying that's very famous because she begins the ghazal with um, a reference to it. She says, tell us that line again, the thing about the dark times, that, that very famous saying about the dark times. When the dark times come, we will sing about the dark times. So again, a ghazal, uh, something that has continuity to a tradition of poetry that we've we're just been uh, talking about, but also a continuity with the tradition that is very different, right? Which is uh, about singing, which is by Brecht, completely different um, German playwright. So when she writes this ghazal that is about the dark times, without even telling us, if you're a student of literature, you immediately know uh, you've read literature to know that she's fusing 
um, these two different traditions and she's doing it in English. One is a German playwright, the other is an Arabic form uh, that is written in English. So um, I think we are running out of time, but um, this was to, to introduce you to the idea that A, uh, the literature that we read in English um, has a rich um, tradition, but the way that literature is, is there are no boundaries that ideas, metaphors, imageries uh, flow from Arabic to English um, across time, across space, um, and they come to us. And many a times when listening to um, a Bollywood film song, um, we probably don't even know that uh, the way that not just the song travels, but also how uh, the rich tradition of its form travels, okay? That it is a form. And um, uh, usually my workshop is followed by, um, we sit in a class and we try to write a ghazal. Following, we reverse engineer uh, the ghazal. We try to, we, st we start with something. This is um, something that uh, happened in our last class. We start with a worksheet with the radif and um, we, we find some synonyms, we find certain uh, rhyming words of, so the kafia can be anything. So in our last class, somebody came up with some very interesting um, kafias. So somebody said pillow of light and halo of light. So we reverse engineered uh, how it would be to write a guzzle. And yeah, so usually we, um, start with the guzzle and we end up trying to write one. Okay. So, yeah, I think um, I'll stop here. Thank you. The billionaire, I think you gave a, what do I say, a slightly different way to look at both guzzles, in these songs, poems. Uh, any questions? I think, I think somebody had pinged me that they want to ask some questions before we move to the next session. Pratiti, do you want to just open it up so that people can ask questions if they have? Please. Pratiti, can uh, you hear? Yeah. Let's see if I can do it. I think there is uh, someone called Kambapati, Kambapati Vamsi who's as a raised yeah. hand. Yeah, but Vamsi, you can, if you have a question, you can ask. You're muted, Mamsi. You have to unmute yourself. Titi, can you hear? Can you let them unmute themselves, please? I'm not able to find that option. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, can I ask you the question first? Yes, please. What's your name? What is the, what is, the, my name is Inaduti Mitra. Okay. And can yes. I ask? Yes, please. What is the importance of ghazals and how it helps us in our life? A ghazal or ghazal? Ghazal. The topic of today's discussion only. No, it's not ghazal. So ghazal was uh, the Arabic word for deer or or. Uh, so, if you're asking me about the ghazal, uh, Inaduti, what is the importance yes, of the ghazal and um, why in our lives? I mean, what is the importance of music in our lives? Um, what is the importance of language in our lives? I think the ghazal is a is um, everything that poetry is. It is about uh, the surprise of language. If you look at the kafia and the radif, if you read more ghazals, um, it's like a lot of times, if you, if you look, if you listen to um, classical music, for example, they keep saying the same things over and over again. And you, and you think, why are they saying the same things over and over again? It's yes. because when we, when we keep repeating something, um, especially when we are reading it out aloud, which is what the guzzle should be, 
uh, you read it with new emotions. So if you notice in the ghazal that, that we read by Aga Shahid Ali, there are various punctuations. So in, in, in Indian uh, languages, we also call it bhav or something, right? The emotion behind it. So the, the, the surprise in the ghazal, the fun in the ghazal, the beauty of the ghazal is the relation between the refrain and the sound. So origin of light, palanquin of light, but you don't say it like that. You don't say origin of light, palanquin of light, coffin of light, bullet. you don't read it like you're reading news. Um, in fact, different people will read it differently. And this is why we read literature, because everybody brings a new interpretation. Everybody brings in a new emotion. When you, it's like, like I, it's my favorite, um, I think, metaphor to use. It's like holding up a snow globe to the sun and turning it around and seeing it from different angles. So in a classical music, they keep saying the same things a hundred times in a in a song because you bring in new emotions. And when you keep using language over and over again, you look at the possibilities of language, not as meaning, but as bhav, as, uh, as tone, as, as um, pitch uh, in the way that you say it. So in class, when you read literature, the same book uh, might be read by 30 people in a classroom, but they have 30 different interpretations. And that is the fun of being in a literature classroom um, is nobody reads it in the same way. So finding that freedom in language, even though we are all reading the same thing, we read it differently with different tone, emotion. And, and why we start with poetry is because the reading of the poem is so important. Knowing that a line is not a sentence is important. So knowing the difference between what you're hearing where the line ends versus what you're reading, how to read is very important in a literature classroom and also in life to, re to read a text message. We use these smileys now, like what we call paratext so that there is tone to it, right? So yeah, because of that. Thank you, ma'am. I understood. Thanks, Dibbil. And I think you answered the importance of language education in school. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was very late. I also realized that, you know, to develop a sensitivity towards others for the emotional capacity that happens through language education. And yes, I think there's a question before we go to the next segment uh, on comics. Uh, Raina, if I'm pronouncing your name better. Last name, sir. Yes. Last it's... name, Raina, but I didn't want to. It's just a... pronounce your first name, but how do you pronounce your name? Uh, Ragnia, the I is silent. Ragnia, yeah, yeah. Uh, good morning, ma'am. My question is, uh, that's very basic, two questions. The first one is, how many different types of guzzles are there? And what purposes do they serve? Because they're different from each other, or if there are different forms. And uh, can we trace the origin of guzzle to one specific region? Or... Is it just like spread out between many countries? Okay, fine. So I am not sure if there are many kinds of guzzles, if you can sort of um, organize the guzzle as different kinds. I, I don't think uh, there is the form of the guzzle. There is more or less, you know, it's a standard form. Usually couplets range from five, from five to 15. Uh, there should be at least five couplets. Um, no, I don't think um, the point is not to trace the origin back uh, to Arabic um, 14th century is what they say, but to see how it evolves, because um, yes, it's important to look where it originated, but it's also important to see how it traveled, how it adapts. And the fact that um, I've been writing poetry for most of my life till I think I only discovered it much later um, in life that uh, the ghazal could be written in English. What's interesting for me is uh, not tracing the origin, but looking at resonances, looking at, uh, let's say, um, the same imagery also coming up in um, Italian sonnets in the 14th century. So 14th century uh, ghazals being written in Arabic, but also 14th century um, 
Italian sonnets that also use the image of the gazelle. So those kinds of resonances are interesting to me and seeing how it adapts uh, and adapts in print because we are no longer sitting in a mushaira and listening to each other. So I wouldn't say there are different kinds of gazelle. The, the point is there's a form and then it adapts. Um, you can have different um, rhymes and rhyme schemes we no longer follow because it's no longer it no longer follows uh, the meter in which it was written in Urdu. In English, it changes. So if you look at the difference between Aga Shahid Ali's of light and Hala Ali's light guzzle, completely different uh, in terms of sound and rhyme. So yeah, I hope okay. that answers Another question. question. Thank you so much. The answer was very uh, insightful. My last question is, if you wanted to tell someone to get into guzzles, like if someone wanted to get into guzzles, wanted to read specifically or know more into certain poets. Uh, is there a book you would recommend or poets to listen to? I would, I would. I would uh, recommend Marilyn Hacker in English. Uh, there are many, many uh, guzzles that Marilyn Hacker has written. Adrian Rich has not written just the guzzle, but also on the guzzle. If you're asking me language, if you're asking me about Urdu, I would say start with Galib. And that's a fairly standard uh, answer to that. Uh, but uh, also listen to uh, Bollywood music and see how many ghazals there are from Jagjit Singh's ghazals to, um, I don't know, Malin Hacker. You know, if, if you understand these languages and if you speak and read and listen to these languages, uh, there's just unlimited number. Don't just go into a book because um then you i think i at least have not come across a book that spans bollywood to uh elite high culture so the interesting thing for me is how the guzzle can move between what we think of as high culture and low culture and uh, that is where uh, i think the fun with literature lies for me okay thank you okay. so i think in the interest of time we should take last two questions because people are two people have raised their hands and then we will go to the next segment uh, but uh, i think i think language education is in safe hands stable enough at least we're listening to the question uh, so amaya and juni in that order and then we end this segment amaya what's your question see so you have raised your hand good morning ma'am uh, first of all i do want to share that uh, this session was informative because uh, I really wanted to pursue English literature and this kind of gave me like a preview on what it would look like if I went into the dustbin. So my question is do uh, guzzles have a specified structure as in like a line length or a line scheme or do they just do slowly? I mean, yeah. Yeah, in the Urdu they did have a specified um a sort of meter but in English uh, there has been experiments with it if you look at the two guzzles that I just read out of light and um, Hala Alien's light guzzle they're completely different and um, the whole point of of introducing this uh, session of of the guzzle in English is uh, to introduce you to the idea that the guzzle can be played with and if you're just starting out, if you're trying to write a guzzle, I would say that don't restrict yourself to meter. Um, but yes, the the more strict uh, rules of the guzzle would be between the kafia and the relief and the harfe ravi, which is the sound. But you can you can even play with that in English, which was not necessarily possible perhaps in languages where it originated, where the rules of the form were stricter. So I would say that. Thank you. Thank you, Amaya, that you found the session. Juni, what's your question? Oh, there's one more uh, hands raised for that. We'll, I'll, we'll stop after Ritika. I didn't want to say no to people. I was slightly five minutes late. But Juni, what's your question? Uh, yes, hello, ma'am. Uh, my question is that uh, you have told about the gazelles be re re being repeated by the audience uh, who are listening to the gazelles. So what's the fact about it? Like normally when we are listening to some music, the audience do not get a chance to repeat after the main persons who's singing. 
But in the gazelles, as you have told, the audience can repeat the line after the person who is reciting the gazelle. That's the thing behind it. So your question is why? Or what is your question? Yeah, why? Um, also, because it's an oral culture, Juni. We, um, print culture, that's a very good question. I should have mentioned that. I usually do it in a class because I give out handouts. So they have that in print. But in an online session, I forgot to mention that. Is because, um, you know, print culture as mass culture, as like, all of us can have print in front of us is in India, it's not more than 100, 150 years old. We literature was, was mostly in the oral tradition and people heard, and that's why I began with a song. And if you look at like older forms of poetry, even religious poetry, if you look at, you'll see rhymes because uh, it was meant to be heard and it was meant to be remembered. So um, you repeated the first refrain so, because you're also taking it in. Otherwise, you know, some, what if somebody has not heard it? So think of literature not just as um, words on paper, but also um, a rich body of oral culture, which is why I played the song. So people repeated it because, you know, you, you wanted to make sure that um, you are creating a base. You're, you're, it's like introducing something. It's like saying, my name is Debelina Day, and somebody says, oh, Debelina Day. Okay. It's, it's a way to remember. It's a way to take in. But it's, it also became that orality and the performative tradition also became uh, sort of the convention was um, to say the first line um, after you said Ishad and after you said Ars Kya Hai. And then also to wait in anticipation for the second line, the surprise of the second line. What is going to rhyme with this word? How is he going? So a ghazal, usually when I do the workshop, I think of it like building something. You build something and then you create a surprise. And it's um, there's a way to talk about it, but maybe not for this session. But, but the answer, the simple answer is because um, a lot of literature comes from oral traditions not necessarily print. You can't go back to uh, the text immediately. So it helps you remember also. Thank you, ma'am. I understood. Thank you. Last question from Ritika, and then we are going to, we have to, and then this can go on. If I, if I just bring in that Ghazal is not only in English or Urdu or Arabic or Hindi, I mean, it's also used in, even in uh, South Indian languages, some of the, some of the musicians uh, uh, back in, just come up with one name. There was a musician in Malayalam cinema called M.S. Baburaj. So he used ghazals uh, like anything. Of course, it had drawn from Hindustani classics. He didn't rely too much on Carnatic uh, music structure, but used Hindustani classical and ghazals. So with Ritika's question, and uh, we're going to end this segment. Uh, yes. Yes, Ritika? I don't know. Some people might have raise the hand uh, by, by mistake. So, Debelina, thank you very much. I think if Ritika, you don't have a question, we should we should uh, end this segment. And I would I would request my colleague uh, Neha to be on, on screen now. But if any closing comments, Debelina, over to you. And then before we invite Neha onto the screen. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for being an attentive uh, audience and asking these very um, insightful questions, I think. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Debelina. So we are going to shift gears now. And uh, we're going getting into the world from Guzzel. We're going into the world of comics, right? And uh, hello, hello. comics is something that I'm sure you, you all would have come across. You were kids. I mean, my... I have to go back. I started reading comics first in, in not in the English language, but in the language of Malayalam. <laughs> and, and then, of course, later transition to this magazine called Tinkle. Uh, but now we have reached the world of people reading something called manga. <laughs> so, but then uh, I'll stop now because there is somebody who's an academic who has tried to look at uh, comics beyond the frames and those pictures. Uh, I'll leave it, to the, leave it to the expert to take it from here, Neha. Over to you, Neha. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Raj Gopal. I'd just like to point out in the chat that you and I have both been uh, hideously dated by one of the students who's asking, what is Tingle? So the generation gap has never been starker. What is, sorry, what is? What is Tinkle? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you uh, to the person who asked this question for reminding us just how incredibly old we are. Tinkle was a very famous children's uh, comic book when we were growing up in the uh, early 90s to late 2000s. That's right, that's right. All right. So I will begin to share my screen. Yes, please. You have the option, right? Yeah. I, I think so. So... Without no, it says a... host disabled participant screen sharing. Rititi, can you... Is please? my uh, screen still being shared or no? Okay, Okay, Neha, I'll, we'll just, I'll just, uh, just try now. Neha, with this. Now you should see that. Yes, yes, now I can. In the interest of time, we were thinking we'll take a five minute break, but you know, the, I think we should just go on. The audience uh, is this visible to everyone? Yes, you can just enlarge. Yeah. Yes. Just yes. Put it in slide yes, show. Yes, yes. Uh, is this visible now? Yes, uh, on the full screen? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. There is a lot of disturbance from uh, participants whose uh, mics are not muted. Please make sure that your mics are muted before we begin. Everyone, mute your mic. Uh, Saeed Bilal, your mic is not muted. Could you please mute yourself? I think, Pradeti, you can mute all and they stay muted for the next 15-20 uh, minutes of the session. Can you do that, Pradeti? I'm not able to find that option for some reason. All right. Uh, so, good morning, students, and thank you so much for joining us for this session today. You've all already had a very productive morning. And uh, like Raj Gopal said, we are running a little bit behind time. So here's what we'll do. I will keep the lecture portion of this uh, segment a little bit on the shorter side. Uh, it's uh, nearly 11 now. Uh, we'll finish with the lecture portion by say 11.20, 11.25 at the maximum. Then we will have some five to 10 minutes for a question and answer session. And we'll cap it off with a very short quiz that will hopefully be both fun for you and a way to sort of recap and refresh your uh, knowledge from this session. All right. So, <clears throat> like my colleague Raj Gopal was saying, uh, one of the benefits of uh, working within the medium of something that is within the realm of popular culture, like comics, is that you can already assume a baseline level of familiarity among your audiences, right? So, you might not necessarily know a lot about the guzzle, but that is not true for something that is so popular as the comic. So before I begin, I would actually like to ask you, what kind of comic production are you familiar with as students? It could be anything. It could be comic strips from the newspaper. It could be comic books, graphic novels. Can I just have a few names in the chat? So I know roughly what level of familiarity I can assume. Just some titles of comic books and graphic novels that you have read. So somebody says that they are familiar with the Tinkle. That's amazing. A lot of Marvel fans here, of course, not a surprise. Uh, Peanuts, yes, of course. Uh, it was a staple of newspapers when I was growing up. Tinkle and Marvel manga, which happens to be a Japanese uh, comic form. Supandi, of course, uh, Calvin and Hobbes, yes, of course, legendary. Archie's, very happy to see that Archie's still retains its dominion over the imagination of Indian students. Persepolis, excellent, excellent. Uh, all right. So I'm very happy to see that there's a great deal of familiarity with the form. Now, why do I say... that there is a distinction to be made between comics as a medium and all of these various examples that you've just given me. The examples that you've given me are specific manifestations, right? The specific 
uh, productions within the bigger medium of comics. So a comic book, a comic strip, a pocket cartoon or a graphic novel is not the same as comics as a medium. Think of the medium of comics as a bucket or a balti, right? And within the possibilities presented by this medium or this bucket, there are all these productions which have different rules. They have different uh, aesthetic uh, criteria. They have different, uh, uh, they are meant to provoke different kind of responses. They are produced with different ends in mind, right? So you have this bucket, which is the medium of comics. And within that, you can create all sorts of uh, texts like the comic book, the graphic novel, the comic strip, etc., etc. So one of the main things that the session intends to do for you is to defamiliarize the comic medium as opposed to the various productions that you're already familiar with, right? So why is it necessary to defamiliarize a medium that is so familiar to a student body like yours, right? What is gained when we set out to defamiliarize something? All right. Now, in my experience of English classrooms within the country, English uh, classrooms within the school setup, there has often been a privileging of meaning and interpretation over form. I don't know if uh, it's the same at all of your schools, but when I was growing up and when a lot of my friends were growing up, my colleagues, my uh, sibling were growing up, the, the first thing that you did in the English classroom when you came across a text, no matter what kind of text it was, was ask yourself, okay, what does it mean? And unfortunately, this instant hankering after meaning, after interpretation, it's not something that is limited just to the written word, right? It's something that has sort of spread to various cognate forms and disciplines. So you look at a painting and the first question you ask yourself is, what does it mean? You look at a sculpture, you ask yourself, what does it mean? You watch a film, you ask yourself, what does it mean? Yeah. And where does this instinct come from? Like a lot of our instincts, it's socialized within us, right? We are taught that to engage with art means to ask art to give up its intrinsic meaning to you. And the meaning somehow resides underneath the surface. The surface is just a sort of superficiality that you have to uh, go beyond, right? Now, what this ends up doing is sort of flattening your aesthetic experience for the rest of your life. Because then you choose to look beyond the granularity of form and how different forms produce very, very different aesthetic experiences and you engage with them in the exact same manner. So it's basically like being handed a hammer and then looking at all of these various things and thinking of them all as nails. So that is why it is important that in the English classroom, we defamiliarize something for you. We ask you to give up your preconceived notions of what it is that you're supposed to look for, of how it is that you're supposed to engage with the form. And we tell you, no, don't look underneath the surface. First, start looking at the surface because the form in a medium like the comic is more important some, sometimes than the content. Now, what do I mean when I say form? Uh, sorry, can you see the next slide? No, no, it's not moving. Okay, yeah, can you see yeah. it now? Yeah. yeah All yeah. right. So here are a few uh, definitions of form that apply to form within the realm of cultural production, right? So you can see that it means the shape and structure of something as distinguished from its material. It means the essential nature of a thing as distinguished from its matter. It also means the structural element, plan, or design of a work of art, right? Now, if you open your English textbook within your classroom, you will be met with a variety of literary forms, right? You are not 
restricted to just one. In, in fact, one of the important functions that a textbook serves is to familiarize you with a variety of forms within uh, print culture, within narrative. So you have poems. And even within poems, you have a variety of forms, as we just discovered in the session before. Even within poetry, you have varieties and types. You have the guzzel, you have the Japanese haiku, you have uh, uh, you have uh, the sonnet from uh, medieval England. You have modernist poetry. You have devotional poetry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have the short story, you have the uh, academic essay or the personal essay, you have a novel, you have a novella, right? Now, as I was saying, while you are introduced to all these variety of forms in school classrooms, what tends to happen is that the meaning of these texts is always much more privilege than an engagement with the form, which is why a session like the one you just had with my colleague Debulina, where she takes you through the structural nuances of a gazelle, right? Through the edifice upon which this form is built, that becomes very important. Because one thing that you will hear over and over and over again in the English classroom is this uh, urge to develop a critical instinct. Critical instinct specifically to do with cultural production, with narratives. Now, what does it mean to hone a critical instinct? Of course, the word critical reminds us of criticism. So we think that, oh, it's probably nitpicking. It's probably to find faults, right? That's criticism. But no, that's a tiny part of it. To develop a critical relationship with cultural production is to start asking yourself, this makes me feel a certain way. I interpret it a certain way. But why? Why is this happening? What is the push and pull between form and content? What are the specific design choices? What are the artistic intentions that have gone into the making of this? What are the gender politics of this particular production? What are the class politics of this particular production? How am I supposed to receive it? Am I receiving it within a community of like-minded people? Am I receiving it on a popular platform? Am I supposed to have a sort of exalted relationship with it as an individual? These are all questions that you then learn to ask because these are questions that become very, very important for you, not just as audience and recipients of this form, but also as possible future creators, right? If you learn to look at production, at cultural literary production from this angle, then you take one step closer to becoming a creator also one day. Because these forms are not stagnant, right? A lot of these forms are very, very old. The guzzle, as my colleague said, is very, very old. But the reason that it perseveres over decades, centuries, is because it has innovated constantly, right? It is constantly adapting itself to new technologies, new audiences, new contexts. And to be able to do that, you have to have a very good eye for the formal properties of something. So today, I will be introducing you to the formal properties of comics as a medium, but not in its entirety, because that's too overwhelming for such a, such a short session. I will only be telling you about two or three very, very important formal properties of the comic, and then fo focusing on one, which is called the gutter. And we'll come to that very soon. Now, on the slide in front of you, you will see the names of two American gentlemen, William Eisner and Scott McLeod. Uh, in my very, very biased opinion, they are two of the coolest people to ever live. Bye. Now, what happens with a lot of cultural and literary production is that there is often a very sharp division between practitioners and scholars, between people who do and people who study. So you look at film, you look at painting, you look at sculpture, you look at poetry, you look at novel, you look at drama. And you will see that there is often this very sharp line between people who are actually making these things and then people who are sort of reviewing them or theorizing them or studying them, right? Of course, there are overlaps, but in general, it emerges that there is a 
gap between practice and theory. That gap, I'm very, very happy to tell you, does not exist for the comic as a medium, right? There is no sharp distinction between the practitioners of comics and the theorists or scholars of comics. The very first wave of comics criticism that arose in the world was pioneered by people who had spent their entire lives making, consuming, computing comics. So people like Eisner and McLeod. Now, how does, th how does this happen and why does this happen? This happens because comics as a medium are thought of as low culture for a very, very long time, right? They're associated with the newspaper, they're associated with a subliterate population, they're associated with the children, they're associated with the market. And so therefore, uh, the academy is gatekept for a very long time. The comics are not thought of as suitable material for serious study. And so therefore, who will do the serious study? Because for any medium to thrive, to innovate, to challenge boundaries, you need to study for it. The practitioners, like Eisner, like McLeod, they thought to themselves, if they won't let us reach the high culture spaces of universities and academies, we will do the studies ourselves in our artist studios, in our comic book publishing companies. So that is what they did. The very first textbook <laughs> come out of this medium is called Comics and Sequential Art. And it was written by this American gentleman called William Eisner, who had been involved in the world of comics since he was a 10-year-old. As a 10-year-old, he loved sketching. And uh, his father passed away quite early. So he became responsible for supporting his household also. So as a very, very young child, he took up the job of selling newspapers on the streets. Hey! And sorry, could you please mute yourself? Everyone, please Neha, can you do me a favor? Can you make me yes. uh, a co-host? I made you a host by mistake. If you can just, okay. I, I'm going to unmute everybody. Yeah, yeah I think uh, somebody has muted everyone. But can you mute in such a way that they can't unmute themselves? Yeah, go, go ahead, Neha. We're good now. You'll have to unmute yourself. I think you also got muted by mistake. You'll have to unmute yourself. All right. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, Naya. Yes, I, I think I'm audible now. Excellent. Yeah. All right. So, as I was saying, William Eisner uh, started selling newspapers on the streets of New York very early to be able to support his mother. And uh, newspapers back then had supplements that were composed of nothing but comics right so he got uh involved in that world very early on he started sending off his uh, sketches his caricatures his cartoons to various newspaper companies and they started publishing him and very soon then as he started maturing into his early 20s he also opened a studio for himself and uh, very very interestingly when america joined world war ii Eisner became one of the first illustrators to be used by American government to uh, sort of further the war effort. Now, why would an illustrator be useful for a government in furthering the war effort? What is it that Eisner could do? So, what Eisner could do was he could imagine what the medium of comics could do in terms of simplifying information and disseminating communication. So a lot of the soldiers that were on the ground had access to very high-tech weaponry, very high-tech tanks for the first time. And these things fell apart all the time, right? These things require a lot of upkeep, a lot of maintenance. And that maintenance could not always be performed by experts and technicians on the ground because remember that they were fighting on another continent altogether. So the soldiers had to be responsible for the maintenance and upkeep of their own equipment. But the soldiers are often not mechanics, they're not engineers, they're not trained to do this. How are they supposed to deal with such high-tech weaponry, such high-tech uh, 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 tanks? They were able to do it because Eisner made very, very simple visual 
comic strips that sort of broke down the the high tech uh, ammunition and the tanks that they had and could in a very granular fashion show which part went where or which part needed to be oiled very frequently or basically how to put things back together once they have broken down right so it is this kind of far sighted vision that served eisner so well that he was eventually invited to teach comics the medium at a university and the book comics and sequential art basically arose as a textbook out of eisner's experience with teaching comics to a bunch of students so the very first formal theoretical definition of comics as a medium that we get is from eisner and how does he define it he defines it as sequential art remember the balti the the bucket of comics as a medium it means to eisner sequential art an art and literary form that deals with the arrangement of pictures or images and words and why does it involve the two pictures images or words because it narrates a story or dramatizes an idea right now another incredibly cool man who built on eisner's theory is scott mccloud who wrote one of the best uh, books on comics called understanding comics and understanding comics is illustrated it's actually a book on comics theory that is written in the form of a comic book so i highly encourage everyone to google that it's a blast to just read this book now mccloud builds on the theoretical foundation provided by eisner and refines the theoretical definition of comics a little bit more so he says comics as a medium involves juxtaposed what does juxtaposed mean it means set against each other right adjacent to each other all right so juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence remember sequence becomes very very important to the definition of comics as a medium so juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence intended to convey information and or to produce an aesthetic response in the viewer so what does it do it basically opens up the world making possibilities of comics as a medium comics no longer have to be restricted to just small funny cartoons or children's stories or even superhero graphic novels no they can convey information they can act as in, they can act as instructive pamphlets right they can produce any number of aesthetic responses so basically now there is a very clear distinction between the medium and the multiplicity of things that it can do and the things that are being done with it currently right so what these men have done is they have enlarged watch the world making possibilities of comics as a medium they have busted wide open for us to just imagine what we can do with this medium its productive potential is infinite all right now like i said sequence becomes very important to the definition of comics what does sequence mean it means movement it means something changes right so take a look at the next slide which takes examples from scott mccloud's understanding comics of what sequen sequentialization looks like all right so you will see that mccloud makes very clear distinction between one isolated pocket that uses the vocabulary of comics and then sequence that actually falls under the ambit of comics as a medium right so if you look at figure 1 in the first square you have a man in a top hat right a victorian looking gentleman uh, who sort of holding his top hat now that under the definition of eisner and mccloud's uh, formulation of comic that single square cartoon it's not a comic it's a static moment in time there is no sequence involved there is no activity there is no motion so that is not something that falls within the ambit of the medium of comics as defined by eisner and mccloud and remember that it's a definition that is widely accepted by both the practice the practicing community as well as the scholarly one but you can convert it into a comic right you can convert it by sequentializing it so what do you do you juxtapose another square and introduce movement so in figure 1 what happens in the next in the next panel 
the man is lifting his hat or doffing his hat. So sequence has been introduced, movement has been introduced, dynamism has been introduced, right? That happens in all the other examples you'll see here. In the second one, there's a gun going bang. In the next one, you see a woman scared of this uh, gun. In figure three, you have the sun setting. Uh, so in the second one, the sun goes further down into the sea. It becomes clear that it's a sunset that we are witnessing. In the last one, which is marvelously simple, you have the act of blinking. So it's a tiny second moment that is captured in this sequence. All right. Now, now we come to a very bad example of a comic strip that I have drawn because I don't have a ton of uh, artistic uh, capabilities. But that will help explain both the title of the session to you and also a few few very important formal elements of comics. So, you will see that in this incredibly simple comic strip, we have three squares or three boxes. You have the you have a man uh, and you have a banana peel. In the first one, the man is walking on presumably a road and there's a banana peel on the ground. In the second one, the man is much closer to the banana peel. And in the third one, what we knew was going to happen has happened. The man has made contact with the banana peel and slipped, right? It's a very, very simple comic setup. Even a child will be able to understand it quite easily. Yeah. Okay. Now, using this very, very simple setup, let's very quickly take a look at three formal elements of comics, of which we will focus on one. What are the three uh, uh, formal elements here? They are panel icons and gutter yeah what is the panel the panel is this boxy thing that sort of encapsulates our action right in very simple terms the square inside of which the action of the story is taking place that's your panel right so you will have come across panels pretty much everywhere if you read graphic novels if you read manga if you read uh, Comic strips, panels are everywhere, right? There are very, very foundational, formal element of comics. Now, there is a ton to be said about the panel, but unfortunately, it's not possible to cover it within one session. So we will leave it for now. The second very important thing here is icon, right? Icon. Now, what qualifies as icons within this particular comic strip? The banana peel and the man. They are both icons. What do icons mean? We'll see in a second. The third very, very important element and the one that we will look at in some detail is the gutter. Now, what is the gutter? The gutter, as you can see in the slide here, is the space between the panels, right? There is a white space that is unused between the panels. You transition from panel one to two, there is a long white space there. You transition from, from panel two to three, there is another white space there that is the gutter and the gutter despite its very very unimpressive name is where most of the magic and mystery of the comic happens how we will see all right now as i said the panel is a very very important element within the medium of comics and there is a ton to be said about it to be thought about it but because we don't have enough time here i will just very very quickly tell you what Eisner tells us about the panel. Now, Eisner invokes Einstein here and Einstein's theory of relativity to state that time is not absolute, but relative to the position of the observer, right? So how does it connect to our understanding of the panel in comics? Because what does a panel do? Panels, basically the boxes, uh, postulate a reality for the comic book reader. The act of paneling or boxing, drawing that box around our action, not only defines the perimeters of the action, but establishes the position of the reader in relation to the scene and indicates the duration of the event, right? So that very, very simple looking box, it's basically building your world for you, right? It's introducing time into the equation for you. Because what are comics? Comics are simple 2D representation, two-dimensional representations of a very, very complex three-dimensional world, right? How does time pass in two, dimension, two dimensions? How is time passing? Time is passing because the 
panel sets that perimeter for us. As we move from panel to panel to panel, there are very, very interesting choices being made by the comic book, by the artist that shapes our sense of time passing, right? So if you look at the example I've shown you here, there are four panels, okay? In the first panel, uh, and all four panels have the same icons. They have a tap and they have a bomb. Now, the four panels basically show you the passage of time. Yes? How do they do that? They do that by relying on your knowledge of how long it takes for a drop of water to fall from the floor. So if you look at the first box, the drop of water is just forming underneath the tap. In the second one, it falls with a splash, right? So we know that barely a few seconds have passed. That is how long it takes for water to fall in real time, yeah? In the third one, another drop of water starts forming. In the fourth one, it forms and bam, the bomb goes off. So in these four panels, how long has it taken for the bomb to go off? Barely a few seconds, right? Through some very, very smart choices and through very intelligent paneling, our sense of time has been so carefully directed by this very, very simple 2D drawing. So that is paneling. All right. Now, what are icons? Icons are basically any image that is used to represent a person, place, thing or idea. Now, of course, comics are not comics without the visual element, right? So the visual element is often introduced in the form of these icons. Yeah. So if you will see here, you have a very photorealistic heart, right? A photorealistic heart is a heart that is very true to what the actual human heart looks like. But when you think of the heart, when you think of representations of the heart, it's not this medically accurate heart that you think of. You think of the simple iconic heart like this, right? So that is how icons basically uh, sort of simplify and then amplify ideas for you, yeah? So if a comic book was set in Paris, how would the comic book uh, convey this information to us through icons? It might, use the it might use the figure of the Eiffel Tower and we will instantly be able to locate that uh, story in, in place and time. Another one might be set near the Taj Mahal. So we will know that the story is happening in India at a certain moment in time. This is the use of icons. In the one that in the banana comic that we saw just a few moments ago, what do you see? You don't actually see a man. You see a silhouette, right? You see a shadow. And what is the shadow composed of? It's composed of a circle. It's composed of these long sort of geometrical figures. That is not what a man looks like at all. And yet, if you ask somebody to describe this comic to you, they will say it's a man falling on a banana. Why? Because we agree that the icon, that this particular icon is a stand-in for a man. All right. So that's your icon. This brings us to one of the, to the most exciting formal element of, uh, of comics as a medium, which is the gutter. Like I've already said, it's the white space between two panels. Now, traditionally, when you are reading comics, no matter what the form is, it could be manga, it could be comic strip, it could be comic book, what do you usually think of as the meat or the substance of the story? What do you think of as the content? You think of the actual drawings within the boxes as the content. That is where the story is happening. That is where the fun is being had, right? The, the small, tiny boxes of white space, that is basically just a design element. That is that is the common commonsensical everyday thinking that goes into reading a comic. But if you are aware of comics at a formal level, you will see that the story actually takes place not in those painstakingly designed and filled panels or boxes, but in this small sliver of white space that we so casually overlook, right? This blank space, that is where our story is happening. So if you look at these two panels right in front of you, what is happening? In the very first one, you have a clock that is set to 10. In the next one, you have a clock that is set to 10, 5. Now, both of these are static images. But when you read them, when you interpret them, you interpret them as telling you that the time has passed. Now, where has the time passed? The time has not passed in the boxes. 
the time has passed in the little sliver of space between the two boxes, right? The time has passed in the gutter. As you move from panel one to panel two, that space, that small sliver of space, that gutter is where the time is passing those five minutes and taking you to the second panel where it's now 10-5. All right. So how does the gutter work? The gutter works by enabling this process that Scott McCloud calls closure, C-L-O-S-U-R-E. So comics give us words and pictures, right? What do we give to comics? We give to comics our imagination. Comics as a medium require so much more audience and reader participation than any other medium, which is why uh, a lot of comics pedagogy has shown that when young children are exposed to comics as a medium, their intellectual development happens at a much faster and sharper rate because no other medium will require this sort of active uh, co-creating on the reader's part. Not a film, not a television show, not music, not poetry, not short story, not novels. No, comics require a much greater degree of reader participation. And that participation is what we call closure. So what does closure do or what is closure? Scott McCloud defines closure as seeing the parts but perceiving the whole. Seeing the parts but perceiving the whole. And this process takes place in the space of the gutter. And without this process, it is not possible at all to read comics. In fact, without closure, it's not even possible to be a person. Why? Because we see the parts but perceive the whole the entire time that we are alive and participating in the world, right? So what do you see right now on the little box in front of you, the Zoom screen? You only see my head and my neck, right? But you're not sitting there in your homes thinking that I simply don't exist underneath my neck, right? You're not thinking that I'm just a disembodied head talking to you. No, you are imagining that beyond the panel of the Zoom box, I have body parts, I have legs, I have hands. And that the wall that you see behind me is not the entirety of my house, right? This wall is part of a bigger room. That room in turn is part of a house. So what is happening? You are seeing parts of me. You are seeing parts of my house, but you are perceiving the whole. You are situating me in my entire context. This becomes very, very crucial to do when you are, when you are reading comics. Yeah. So, like I said, the action of closure is done by you all the time in your real everyday uh, living. So, for instance, in the uh, in figure one, you see uh, a panel where something is drawn, right? And if I ask you to describe what is drawn, you will say, oh, these are many bottles of Pepsi. But if you look at it very carefully, you can't actually see bottles. You can only see parts of bottles, right? You're only perceiving the parts. But you are telling yourself that logically, if you see the front half of this bottle, then the back half also exists, right? So that is perceiving. Uh, that is seeing the parts, but perceiving the whole. In the second one, you see an open wallet. And what do you see in that open wallet? You see half dollar bills, you see half cards. Now, logically, the dollar bill that you see, the half of it is the part that you see outside of the flap, right? You don't tell yourself that, oh, this person is carrying only half a dollar bill or half a card. No, you tell yourself the rest is very much in there. It's just inside the flap and I can't see it, right? So that is another act of everyday closure. So what does closure look like within the world of comics, within the medium of comics? Uh, so like Scott McCloud says, it's a medium, comics, where the audience is a willing and conscious collaborator and closure is the agent of change, time and motion. Closure is the agent of change, time and motion. Like I said, all the dynamic activity that is happening in the space of comics, it's not happening where the actual drawings and words are. No, it's happening in that little white space where nothing is. Yeah. So again, in this example, in the first panel, you have a man touching his hat. In the second one, you have the man doffing his hat. And 
where has the movement happened the movement has happened in the blank space and how has the movement happened the author the artist has made suggestions and landmarks for you the reader to create the movement for yourself the movement cannot happen unless you are a willing conscious collaborator yeah that is closure so look at this uh, uh, juxtaposition of two panels again this is from scott mcleod's uh, understanding comics in the first panel you have two people one in the uh, foreground one in the background uh, the foreground person seems very terrified the one in the background seems very terrifying so what is happening apparently the person in the foreground is being attacked by the person in the background right and the person in the background is saying now you die then suddenly scene shifts in the second panel what do we have we have the silhouette of a city at night we have the moon which tells us that it is night and we have this bold exclamation which we read as a shout so can somebody unmute themselves and tell me how do we read this panel is it possible to unmute Or, or you can answer me in the chat. How would you read this panel? How would you interpret it? They can unmute. They can unmute themselves now. So, uh, can one of you tell me how to read this panel? What do you think has happened in the space of the panel? <laughs> There's a lot of. Uh, Oral disturbance. Uh, please, please mute yourself. And if you want to answer, answer in the chat. Yes, so you're saying shout Ia or actually from either side. Okay, but what you're giving me are literal descriptions of what's happening in the panel, right? What do you think has happened in terms of the story? The killer has hit the man. So the man shouted Ia in first one. Okay, the guy dies. Excellent, excellent. So everyone will agree that that is how we will normatively read the comic, right? That the guy has died. Except, how do you know the guy has died? We have not been shown the guy murdered on the ground, bleeding out, right? What have we been shown? We have, be, we have been shown the city at night and the sound of a human scream, right? So who has killed the man in the first panel? It's not the artist or the writer of the comic that has killed the man in the first panel. It is you, the reader, who has uh, dealt the fatal blow. You have killed the man because you have interpreted it or you have performed a closure where the first panel leads to the murder of the man. Yeah. So that's an act of closure that is happening on your end and how is that happening on your end it's not an uninformed or uneducated act of closure no you have you're bringing a ton of experience consuming other media particularly crime uh, films detective films noir films right you're bringing all of that knowledge to play here and therefore the second panel which does not show a murdered man it just shows a city at night and the sound of what we interpret as a human scream and you think oh the second panel has to do with the logic of the first panel so it means that the man has died in the second panel right that's an act of very advanced closure that you are able to perform in a few seconds okay so i've already taken more time than i intended i will leave you with one last comic that frankly blew my mind the very first time i read it because it truly opens up the possibilities that the medium of comics can show you once you have a hang of its formal elements. Yeah. So this is a comic uh, from a European uh, publisher and it's called Mr. Invincible. I will give you uh, a minute to quickly read it. Please do. It's a six panel comic. Take a minute and read it quickly.
is everyone done okay i will assume that everyone's done so now what happens within the space of these six panels in the first one you have an elderly man whose cat has apparently climbed uh, a tree and now the cat is out of the man's reach so he meets uh, this superhero called invincible and he tells him that his cat is stuck in the tree in the second one he is asking the superhero can you bring the cat down for me and the man says oh uh, i don't actually have to go all the way up the tree and what does he do he reaches across the wide space of the gutter and he picks the kitty up from the fifth panel because that is closer to him yeah so in the third one he brings the kitty that he has picked up from the fifth panel and he gives it to the man in the fourth one the man ends up with two cats and he says oh what what's happening and then what does invincible say invincible says no you don't have two cats you actually only have one cat it's just that our panels have not synced up with time or reality yet and of course in the next panel you have the overlap between panel 2 and panel 5 you have invincible picking the cat up the cat is going out of the frame and in the last panel the man is left with one cat and one cat alone yes when i read this comic i did not know that you could play with space and time on a two dimensional page like that yeah so if you had to put a title or a tag to this story you might call it science fiction yeah because through a very through very few smart choices being made with placement with the reaching across gutter the comic has completely scrambled our sense of space and time and now within the space of these panels everything seems possible yes so this is why we focus on the form of something like comics as a medium because it is the form and it is a the ma it is the mastery of this form that will open up its possibilities for you and the possibilities are immense we have only just started exploring those this is not a medium that is going to die out anytime soon it has been here for a couple hundred years already longer actually if you count uh, 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 other forms of uh, sequential art like the bayou tapestry and we have only just now gotten started so i am very very excited and hopeful for the future of comics as a medium and hopefully i've been able to convey some of that to you this session so that brings us to the end of this particular session uh, i am open to any questions that you might have and then we have a short quiz for you thanks neha i think this was uh... i think i will i will not be looking at comics this, the way i have looked at before so so but i think we should take questions uh, from the participants if there are any i'm, I'm sure they're still digesting and then kind of processing what we just said about comics and it's also quite popular uh, in 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 what we call the story board right some of the some of the movie makers want to kind of visualize how their movies would look like before it's shot and then Oh, absolutely. Some of them also use it for uh, advertisements or even movies or even. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have a question from Inaduti Mitra. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, Inaduti. Ma'am, your lecture was really good. Ma'am, I used to draw comics as a hobby. I didn't know so much about comics. Your lecture really taught me a lot. So, can I ask oh. my question? I have some question about the comics culture. like uh, where was it developed or what is the origin of comics what is the origin of comics okay so uh, inaduti thank you for a very interesting question and i am very happy to report that no one culture can lay a sort of monopolistic claim on developing comics yeah comics in the form that you recognize now right with the panels with the borders that is recent that has developed in uh, uh, early 20th century europe but that is a modern form of comics comics in its simplest uh, vision as sequential art that is centuries old and you will see uh, you will see variations of that of sequential art like that 
everywhere. You will see that in Europe, you will see that in Asia, you will see that in America. So you have the, this thing called the Bayou Tapestry, right? What's a tapestry? It's basically these uh, drawings that are sort of embroidered on cloth. Yeah. And what do they do? They tell you a story. That's why sequential art. They tell you the story of a boy. So that's, I think, some 14th, 15th century European thing. In India, if you go to some of the temples down south, you will see scenes from, uh, from Ramayana or the Mahabharata edged onto the walls, right? And what are those scenes telling you? Those scenes are telling you the story of uh, episodes from the Ramayana or Mahabharata, right? So that also falls within the ambit of comics because that is sequential art. Somebody said cave paintings? Absolutely. Why not? Cave paintings often told you the stories of hunts or say a bad harvest season. So within a very sort of rudimentary understanding of comics as sequential art, that is very much part of the vocabulary of the medium of comics. So like I said, the modern day recognizable form of comic is from early 20th century Europe. But it has far longer roots back in time. And I would very, very highly recommend uh, Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics for a very, very uh, uh, thorough and comprehensive look at the medium. And I hope that you continue uh, drawing and writing, of course. Thank you, ma'am. And one last question I have. Go on. Go ahead. Ma'am, just a second. Ma'am, previously I used to think that gutters are a, are a type of thing that helps us to focus on the panels when there are a lot of panels and they are colored. Ma'am, was the interpretation correct? Ah, so uh, that is exactly what an un untutored uh, interpretation would be, right? Because when we are growing up reading comics, we are usually left to our own devices. It, it, some, some, something about comics is quite intuitive. So we don't require tutoring. We don't require our parents to tell us what is happening. We figure it out, right? And that is the normative, normal yes. understanding of comics. That action is happening within the, within the frames where the pictures are, where the words are, right? So it's actually very counterintuitive to think that action is happening not where the images and the words are, but in that little white space. And who do we have to thank for that radical breakthrough? We have the practitioners, right? People like Eisner, people like McLeod, who, who consumed comics while they were growing up and who made them, who drew them for decades and decades, innovating upon the form. So I will not say that it is incorrect, your interpretation, that action and movement and story is happening in the blanks but i will say that it's an untutored understanding right that there is something to be said for inverting that that you actually have a better more critical understanding of comics when you start thinking of that negative space of the gutter as the space of possibilities so it's not either or, right? If we just had white spaces, we didn't have any drawings or words at all, there would be no comics, right? So it's it's an intermingling of both. But personally, I would say that it's the gutter that is actually driving most of the action because the gutter is where you're bringing your imagination, right? As a reader, it's where you're bringing your knowledge of how genres function. I hope that answered you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Uh, Vamsi, okay. what's your question? I think there are two questions, one from Vamsi and then Ragnia. Yes. Vamsi, please go ahead. We'll go to Ragnia. Uh, there are actually a couple of questions in the uh, chat box. Chat Can I address also. those? Please okay. Do, please. Uh, Eisner as the father of comics. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I, I will have to tell you about this particular uh, uh, bugaboo of mine. I don't like it when uh, uh, somebody is referred to as the father of something because what that usually ends up doing is removing the mother out of the picture, right? Things are rarely very black and black and white like that. I it's it's very rare that you know you can uh, you can pinpoint one particular man in time as the creator of something. Creation is often a collective effort, right? And we know that in history, the effort of a lot of women, of people of color is sort of irreal. So Eisner is very, very important to 
our modern day understanding of comics eisner is very important to the tradition of american comics and american cartooning but eisner is not the father of comics because i don't think there is any father figure anywhere right it's it's a collective effort we build upon who came before us and the histories are always partial right the women who have contributed to this field have often been written out and we are only now starting to find their traces okay what are some of eisner's famous comics so eisner is actually credited with the, writing the very first uh, graphic novel in the world it's called a contract with god a contract with god i will type it out in the message and it's a it's a great piece of work it's very very good so i will recommend that you start from there what are some of my favorite comics okay so uh, my phd dissertation was on uh, uh, indian graphic novels and i was very lucky to come across very cutting edge work from modern day indian artists so one of my all time favorites and one that i can recommend to everyone is uh, this graphic novel called kari k a r i by uh, a goan artist called amrita patel it's the story of a woman who doesn't really fit within heteronormative standards she moves to a city that is not named but that's very clearly mumbai and it's a story about her finding herself you know the struggles of finding a house the struggles of dealing with parental expectations of what your life should look like all of that it's a beautiful piece of work kari by amrita patel can you share the link for the quiz yes i can uh i think sadaf is going to share i'm sharing the link oh, okay I, I i think my colleague sadaf is going to be sharing that yeah, i think somebody is asking the ppt the ppt this is this session is recorded we will try to share that in some format uh, but i'm not sure whether i would like to share the ppt but let it decide any more questions i can see two hands raised by vamsi and uh, Uh, there is another one that i'd like, like to address because i think a version of this question was also <laughs> posed to my colleague devlina and it's a question that honestly plagues humanities what is the use of comics in our life right oh my god okay that's my favorite i'll also add later when you once you say <laughs> yeah <laughs> go so, for it so uh, yeah so like i said it's a question that plagues all humanities nobody ever asks physics or chemistry or bio or math teachers what's the use of this right you assume that those things are automatically useful so i will tell you what one of my favorite writers uh, said long ago about art oscar wilde he said art is completely useless it makes nothing happen right so the idea that things have to be useful to us in some way that gives us a lesson or furthers our career or gets us accolades or or gets us money that's also not an instinct that we're born with as humans you know it's a it's an idea that the this world late capitalism has sort of uh, built in you over decades and centuries of indoctrination you are not as human beings born asking okay how does this help me in my career or how does this help me in my life that is not a framework that is natural or instinctive that is a tutored response right so in that way i would like to say that art has no particular use in that way which is honestly why art is so important because our lives are sort of controlled by what is useful and what is good and what we should be doing all these vitamins that we should be taking all this math that we are doing these extra coaching classes that we are taking right so i think art is a wonderful uh, break from all of that it's it's there to make you feel human you are human you want to connect with other people you want to show them how you feel you want to understand how they feel you want to feel less alone you want to express yourself right that is what art is for so in short comics are also for that of course i mean you can put them to all sorts of use eisner used comics to show soldiers how to repair their own weapons you have uh, these small instruction booklets that come with all your electronics right your phones tvs washing machines they tell you how to operate them how to take care of them that is useful but that is not art uh, rajgopal you said you wanted to address that question no 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 i think it's a, it's a continuation i think this was asked to uh, i can't remember the professor's name and it was asked to him in a sarcastic manner 
uh, you know, what is the use of humanities? You know, that's a humanity subject in terms of language, literature, history, or philosophy kind of thing. And uh, he thought and he said, very answered very, very carefully. And as you said, they were comparing with, you know, other uh, monetary benefits of success, you know, money and all that. He said politely, humanities could be the only reason that you may want to live. So the, I found that answer very, very powerful to say that, you know, if you look at what we're doing with all the busy business, uh, world, you rely on uh, something that is softer, that suits your mind, calms your mind, which could be music, it could be art, it could be movies that you're watching. And and and, and it's humanities all around us, but we don't see that, we don't observe that. So my question to you, quickly to Nehan Debilan, this was wonderful. I mean, when I walked into the session, I, I was not sure what to expect. I've been hearing great things from colleagues who, who attended your workshops in person. Is this something that you teach as part of your BA English program as, a, as an elective or as part of the core course? How, how does Gazelle and Comics comes into the English literature curriculum uh, at a Zim Prince University? Um, so, just to continue from uh, what my colleague uh, Neha and Rajagopali were saying, I think um, just to continue with what you were saying about the usefulness. So one way is like Neha said, you know, and you're saying, but the other way to look at the study of literature is we're not just reading it. We are studying it because art is also very powerful. And when we read a novel, we see why it is powerful and why are so many people still reading it? So we read it not in terms of its usefulness, but in terms of its effect. So why do so many novels sell? Why do so many people listen to music? And why do so many people read comics, uh, read comic books? So um, when we study literature in a classroom, we are not just idly sitting and, and reading something because we can't read it at home and we need a course for it. No, that's not what we do. Uh, when you study something, you reflect about why something is so powerful why something is so entertaining, right? So just like you study also cinema and, and just to add to what Neha and Raj Gopal said, imagine tomorrow your cell phones technology is useful, right? But imagine if your cell phones couldn't take silly selfies of you, couldn't play music, couldn't play film. If it could only make business calls, would your cell phone sell? So um, the human is at the center of technology, of science, of everything. It's just... I think the way that you know we market humanities versus science in terms of its earning potential, but um, that's a very, very um, um, sort of uninformed idea of the humanities. Um, in fact, if you look at economics, if you look at behavioral economics, if you look at the overlaps between marketing, behavioral economics, psychology, what Neha was saying, perception, they all talk to each other. And after a point, the humanities is a very, it's a very lateral way of looking at the world. It is not simply about picking up a novel. And, and if you look at literature, literature is the only discipline that is about life. Uh, when a writer sits to write, uh, he doesn't say that, oh, you know what? I'm only going to put words in a mechanical fashion on the book. No, the, the, the writer has uh, why we read literature is because we want to uncover the reason why a book that is 150 pages long, which has no use per se, except to entertain you, is so powerful. And um, I, I, I want to um, also reiterate that that. Uh, if you look at education now, education is not simply about dry usefulness. It has to be interesting. It has to also be a little entertaining, I think. And um, uh, just coming back to Raj Gopal's question about uh, what we do in um, Azim Premji Bhopal, is right now we don't have the guzzle or um, sort of uh, the comic as far as I know. We have an introduction to uh, literature that has all kinds of forms. And, and I'm sure many of you, when Neha is saying formal, when I'm saying form, uh, you don't probably understand it. Now, just to give you an example, um, the same idea. So let's say uh, when you read a novel like Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, like right? high culture. 
but that is the form in the sense that it has to have a plot, it has to have a character, and it has to have certain features to be called uh, a novel. But what is the idea there? Um, the idea there, um, and the many ideas, one of it is about Prometheus. It's about the myth of Prometheus. And if you look at a mythology book, you have the same myth, um, but in a different form, in a different way that it's told. So think of a water bottle, right? Uh, a water bottle can have different shapes. It's still holding water. It's still a bottle, but there are different forms. So uh, what we do in a literature class is we look at the iteration of an idea through many forms. What happens when it's a short story? What happens when it's a comic? Because nobody has monopoly over ideas, right? Um, so the same idea, what happens when it's a poem? What happens when it's a short story? What happens when it's a myth? And um, literature, in a sense, um, uh, is one of the only disciplines that will take these very old stories that still have power over our brains, whether it's a Mahabharat, whether it's um, Prometheus, whether it's the Greek myths, whether it's anything. And it will give you its relevance um, in today's world. Or if you're not looking at the classics, if you're looking at uh, the way we live now, uh, what about the stories that have never been told? Like Neha was saying, not just the father of comics, but also the mother of comics. What, what happens um, to, the, to people who we did not think of as heroes? You look at um, classical literature, heroes were only men, but they were only royal men. Think of uh, the stories that we hear now. That's not the case. Anybody can be the hero of their story. Now, what happened to that history? What were some of the mediums and how did that change? Uh, why aren't uh, only kings fit to be heroes, right? So from the idea of the hero to the idea of the protagonist, uh, to the storyteller, there's a, there's a huge shift that happens. And what we do in a literature class, in introduction to literature, is look at some of these ideas, look at storytelling con conventions, look at form, and um, just give you a sense of, uh, that's the first course we do. And so as of now, the Guzzle is not, uh, the, I think there, is, there might be um, one Guzzle in introduction to literature in the poetry section. There are many selections. Uh, there are various forms, so. And I'm, I'm sure in the final year, those who are interested to do a research around Guzzles or comics, they could carve out a honors research project Yes, <laughs> around various forms of guzzles, which we have not thought through or the possibilities of comics that Neha said could be a research project. Yeah. So I think on that note, uh, we, we, sh we, will, we should end the session. There's, a, some, some of them were, uh, there's a quiz and a feedback form yeah. um, attached with the quiz. Please fill that out. That helps us um, sort of know what you think and, you know, improve our interaction. So Definitely. please don't forget to fill that out. And uh, <laughs> some of you had sent me a direct message. I think they are in the, probably in the class 12 asking me about the BA English program. See, today's session is not designed as something to talk too much about the BA English program. But if you would like to know, it's it's all uh, quite neatly explained on our website. And if you're somebody looking to join an undergraduate program, uh, this year, that is in 2024, you should take a look at uh, the programs offered. We are now in, actually inviting applications for the Bhopal campus. Uh, so you should do that. And uh, on that note, my colleagues behind the scenes who help Sadaf, uh, Prititi, is anything else that you would like to tell? Uh, or and should we end the session now? Yes, Raj. Uh, just put the link. Yeah. Okay. No, this is the link for the... Yeah. This is the link for the Azim Premji English uh, that somebody asked for. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that, that talks about how we look at them. So on that note, thank you again, uh, Pitalina and Neha, for this wonderful session on Gazelle and Comics. Uh, I'm going to listen. I'm probably watch the movie Sarfarosh one more time just so that I can enjoy the song <laughs> again. And then go back to my old comics of reading Kalia the Crow and Kabish the Monkey one more time. And uh, we're back again tomorrow for those who are going to stay with going to stay with us for all the sessions tomorrow. We're going to talk about uh, sciences, but we're going to look at aliens that's amongst us. 
uh, we will talk about uh, liger not the movie uh, but, uh, the hybrid, hybrid species and and the point we're trying to make through biology or through the science session is biology is not only about human physiology uh, wanting to make you the next big doctor right we do of course we do need doctors but biology is much beyond looking at uh, only human physiology and on that note that's a wrap from us today thank you uh, and then we'll see you tomorrow uh, at 10 o'clock not same time 10 o'clock in the morning thank you and have a wonderful day ahead. bye thank you so much you too Bye. 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 Bye.